Welcome to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, and uh, we're going to do another long form interview with a friend of the show. Um, he's he, he's kind of slowly becoming our uh, our resident insider when it comes to the Montreal underworld, the Quebec underworld. And we got so much stuff that we've been reporting on up there. It's a beehive of criminal activity and and feuds and fire bombings and murders and shootings and construction takeovers. Uh, Kenny Absolutely. Cam Pereira, uh, one of the uh, true good guys in, in the fight against organized crime uh, on the, you know, across the border. Um, he's, he's kind of, uh, his reputation precedes him in some places because of all the uh, whistleblowing and, and, um, just great work he's done trying to uh, combat the issue of organized crime. Ken, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Scott, for having me again. Uh, so we t- we brought it. Ken was on with us in the summer, and it was kind of more of a um, kind of bio of of Ken. And um, not to say that we don't want to go get into more of his life experiences. We definitely do, and this will it will, it will color up this episode. But I kind of wanted to wanted to bring him back on to discuss kind of the current state. Um, of things in Montreal between the, or Quebec, I would say in general, between the uh, Hells Angels and the Rizzutos. Um, I report, I'm going to shut up in, yep. in, in ten, 10 seconds and give it over to Ken. Uh, so in the last week or so, uh, La Presse came out with a great piece by um, Vincent, LaRouche. Vincent LaRouche, who uh, wrote about the environmental truck hauling business uh contaminated soil and this val valosphere trucking company which is a, a huge staple in the in the cartage hauling business in Quebec uh has a lot of Quebec city contracts and La Presse reported how val valosphere seems to have been taken over in one respect or the other or by the hell's angels and then I piggybacked off that and talked about how you know, kind of wars or battles within the war uh, between Hells Angels and Rizzutos, how right now it looks like the Hells Angels have taken the construction racket, which has a a serious dovetailing with the cartage hauling uh, industry and appears to be bleeding resources of the Rizzutos by blocking them out of contracts and whatnot on construction sites and and, and trucking. so, Ken, let's kind of talk about what we got going on here. Absolutely. Listen, uh, I just want to do a little uh, history lesson. Yeah, please. <laughs> some people. Please. Uh, the mob all over North America was always around the garbage companies, right? You mm-hmm. know, the picking and other. And in a certain way, they've evolved into the environmental yeah. picking, you know? So yeah. from waste management to waste management, you know, they're, they're, they're everywhere. They just evolve with the time. So what we've seen in the past, the 1950s, 60s, you know, that they control the garbage industry and they got uh, city contracts and all this. Now it's evolved in the environmental. So, and you have to understand how it's so important because you and I, we spoke last time, we we briefly passed over that pass and we talked about the environment and how much, you know, it's corrupt and they're the mob or the bikers or whatever organized crime unit is. They're saying, listen, we're going to get from the people who inspect the land to the people who buy the land to the people who give the, the licenses or where we put the the contaminated land we control everything so and it's a huge multi-billion dollar industry per year and now it's associated also with uh native reserves you know so they could put their 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 land spills or whatever they want to on that on that island or on that uh, that land which is not really controlled by the Quebec government. So it's it's a huge business, it's a huge racket, and not a lot of people really want to start digging. <laughs> Sorry, the term. No, no pun intended. No pun intended. Yeah. They, they really don't want to because there's huge contracts that are given by 
legitimate companies right. that want to get rid of their contaminated soil, but they're paying extra if they're putting it in special places. So uh, they're subcontractors who are really associated with the organized crime. Just take it, drop it in Ontario, which is our province. They go drop it sometimes out of the, the city in land that is controlled already by the mob friends so it, it's a huge huge thing and what's so incredibly uh, ironic it's a lot of these players were part of the public inquiry uh, a guy you spoke about louis pierre lafortune okay this guy is an incredible wheeler and dealer and it's very important to see which side he is you can just by seeing where he's going, you can be finding out where the shift right. is going. Right from the from the Rizzuto power to the Hell's Angels power. Exact, exactly. He's very close to Casper. We met. I think he went to yeah. school with him, and he yes. even told. Me, and don't forget, he's the same guy who sat down with me and told me, "True, the leader of the FTQ construction leader saying you got to meet Renal Desjardins." Renal Desjardins was the right-hand man of Vito Rizzuto. Rizzuto and became his enemy number one. Right. This is the same guy who was called up. And this, this is where you could put all the stories together. He was Mambushi tried to kill him in prison, right? And what we know is Gregory Woolley was the man who told Mambushi, listen, uh, you want to get in good standings, whatever, you know, do this for us and it's going to be okay. Mambushi doesn't do it. Gregory Woolley gets killed later. And he was very close to the Rizzutos. So you're seeing a power struggle or a power shift moving from one, one hand to the other. And we know that Gregory Woolley was not friends with Casper we met. This they had a huge, huge beef that probably <laughs> was the final straw. I mean, at least through my reporting and my investigation, the issue right. with with Wumay or Wumet, um was the final straw in leading to uh, Greg Woolley's uh, assassination in last November. And a very influential man. I mean, even though he spent a lot of time in prison, very influential. And he got out. Got out in, the, in September of 23 and Woolley was dead by November. Exactly, exactly. So so you see that power shift and it goes to we could we could say the corporates, you know, the Louis Pierre Lafortune who doesn't have no 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 criminal record. Right now he has one because of diligence. Well, he no, he does he he was busted with Yes, he did, he did. Sorry, with, yeah. With Wame and back in 09, I think. Yes, exactly. And it's Operation Diligence, and they found out. And this is where my story comes in a bit because because of the public inquiry. Diligence was was I uh, had microphones everywhere at videotapes. Until this day, they didn't take all the information out yet. So we don't know how many of the union leaders were talking to the mobsters and talking to the politicians. All we know was Louis Pierre Lafortune was a man very important in this scheme. And I have a little story on him, which is kind of important to understand. In the port of Montreal. There's a huge complex called 1000 de la Commune. I sent you a picture, okay? So I don't know if you're going to, but okay. okay. And that's a condo, a condo structure, high end condos, okay? $500,000, $600,000 and more, you know, to go into five to six million dollars. And what did Louis Pierre Lafortune do? Is he had the Liberal Party at that time, he had some fundraising dinners at that place, and everybody was there from the criminal aspect to the legitimate aspect. Everybody who used to go there. And this Mille de la Commune was built by Tony Maggi. Right. And Tony Maggi needed money. So where did he go? He went to see the Rizzutos because, and this is where we had this huge beef between the Maggis and the Rizzutos. And then Maggi started hanging around with a street lord called Ducarme Joseph. Right. which got shit, uh, shot later, killed, and people think maybe it was uh, Gregory Woolley. You know, we don't know yet, or maybe you know, I don't know, but... Uh, that, no, that was... I've, I've heard that, and then yeah. isn't there also um, 
the belief that uh, Joseph might have been the trigger man on the uh, Nicky Rizzuto murder. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. exactly. And that's why they, they they wanted him dead. But it shows the power struggle, right? So it's maybe a Hell's Angels who was close to the Rizzutos that did the job to kill Zucam Joseph. Uh, and this, this guy's story is incredible because, uh, you know, he was doing voodoo. <laughs> he, he was a, a black black magic and he thought he could he would never gonna get killed because he got shot a couple of times and never got everybody missed so he thought always that he you know he had this voodoo spirit around him and all this and he's the same guy that i met a couple of years ago in a restaurant and he told me you want sorry my french but he says you want to get rid of these wops you just tell me you just give me access to the solidarity fund and i said thank you very much so you, you just see how they just show up in front of you and they tell you as if I could give them their right. access to the solidarity fund. But they didn't he this guy was a real street thug with an army of what's happening now, 15 year olds, 14 year olds with guns, with machine guns, yeah. ready to kill, and the mob because it's getting older. They don't have as much soldiers as before, and there's this new crime, this new wave that's getting up and they're confronting the, the the old traditional original gangsters and the the hell's angels also you know you you, you yeah. see it both ways i don't i don't necessarily want to go down no, okay I mean, well, no no i want okay. to talk about everything you're about to say i just wanted to throw something else in but yeah. i don't i don't necessarily want it to derail us so try to kind of maybe keep the uh, i might be jumping ahead of ourselves but you did mention how we got 14 15 year old kids now that seem to be um, thrown into this uh, war and being used as puppets and proxies and, and kind of pawns on a chessboard yeah. uh, just in the last month uh, or six weeks, you had a 14 year old uh, boy who allegedly was working on behalf of the Rizzutos via the blood family mafia and ice pick Tramel get murdered and torched by Hell's Angels affiliates in Frampton. Absolutely. Um, you, a couple of weeks ago, you had a, a a tourist a woman from France and her seven-year-old daughter got killed in a firebombing attack. Um, I, would, you, would, would you say it's accurate when I say that this reminds me a little bit of back in the great Quebec biker war when innocent civilians start to get into the crosshairs, I guess the 14 year old wasn't necessarily an innocent civilian. I mean, he went there to, to, to try to shoot yeah, up or- To get his colors, to get his colors. Right. Or get his, his but it, it, it seems to be resonating now, uh, almost two years into this conflict, uh, violence has been percolating for yeah. for, um, for almost two years now, but it, it seems like when that happened over the last month or two, that the, powers that be uh, are now finally kind of, not to say they weren't paying attention before or weren't doing anything before, but you know, there, there's going to be hearings now held. It, it yeah. seems like this is some type of, I would say, tipping point. You're absolutely right. I think also what it is, is they know that they don't, the, the first collateral damage of an innocent bystander will just explode and they want to advance this before uh, there's a a jeep that explodes and kills that little kid that killed uh, like, 20 yeah. years ago so yeah. that that's what i i feel and it's exactly what you think uh, you're saying it's exactly that feeling right now you're seeing the political side getting into it you're seeing the cops want exactly to get more resources so they can get into them and try to get them because right now it, it, it it's a power struggle and if i couldn't tell you something because i yeah. listened to you uh faithfully the Rizzutos, at one point, in my opinion, were taken like for for dead. So people thought, you know, listen, these guys, you know, they did their time. They're going to shift over. They're going to let themselves over. And I just want to tell people that don't ever forget that the Rizzutos put $7 billion structure in Sicily, right? They wanted to build a bridge from Sicily to the mainland, and they were the ones behind it. So they have a lot of resources. They had a lot of money. And even though the head of the family died and the father also died and all that, they don't want to leave that power 
that easily. So they were the ones uh, associated, and we took them a bit for granted in a sense that, you know, the Hells Angels were going to take over yeah. totally and all this. So this is what's happening here in Montreal. We're seeing a huge power struggle between two units. They're using minor league players. We could say, you want to come up? And play in major leagues, well, you want to be part of the clubhouse? Well, do this for me and do this for me. And that's what's happening right now on the streets. You it's, know, it's, it's an interesting um, just pos juxtaposition to most of the, uh, the Italian on Italian mafia wars, um, at least of the, you know, the, the most recent ones in U.S. history happened in the 80s and 90s. And in those, for the most part, you had actual made members of the mafia going out on these hit squads. Yeah. You don't, this is both, both sides of this. Uh, you have this, this huge powder keg of a war going on, but for the most part, it's all proxies exactly. that are like four or five steps removed from the top guys that are the ones that are, you know, the, the boots on the ground warfare. And these are the same people who, at the beginning, are also saying, I'm not going to pay my due on the cocaine or whatever they're selling. I, so right. you, you, you're seeing this power struggle because they're getting older. This is my opinion. You know, I'm not saying that I know well, anything about we want. it. We want that here. Yeah, they're, they're getting older, older and older. So all these guys says, OK, I'm the new guy on the block. I'm taking control. And slowly they're seeing that there's a there's, you know, the Fido Rizzuto said something quite interesting. He says, the second I die, I go to prison in California, in uh, Arizona, sorry. The Col uh, Colorado. Colorado, you're right. He says, listen, it's going to be mayhem in Montreal. Yeah. And he, it, his words were totally right because. Prophetic. Exactly. The power struggle started with him leaving and there's a vacuum. And now all of them want to start their own little entity. But it's kind of funny that the same people like uh, the, uh, the little, the what's it, Turmel, what's his, his but the, the mafia group, he, he calls himself, Black Family. Blood, blood Family Mafia. David blood blood Family Turmel, Mafia. Yeah. Exactly. So him, it shows really that he wants to take that little part of he wants Quebec. Quebec. He wants Quebec City. That's exactly. what Turmel wants. Hey, we got a man here in Saguenay, Lac Saint Jean, which is up north, who the cops are asking for two hundred thousand dollars. They have pictures of him post on the highway. It's it was never done as much two hundred thousand dollars to so we can give him information on this guy, and he's hiding somewhere in Montreal, in in Montreal, maybe out of in the rest of well, Canada. Tur or yeah, Termel right now is yeah. we're talking about Termel. He's been on the run. For a year and a half, the we word thought he was that in Portugal. They thought he was in. Well, he, he was spending some time in Portugal. He yeah. was jumping around Europe. Now the word is that he's in North Africa. Um, to me, not to, not that I needed further proof because I'm, I believe strongly in my sourcing and my yeah, reporting yeah, for sure. But if you were somebody that doubted the reporting that Ice Pick Tremel and Blood Family Mafia had aligned with the Rizzutos in some way shape or form to, to kind of fight their battles in quebec city um and now it looks like blood family mafia is expanding to other parts of, of quebec uh doesn't it reinforce the belief or what i'm reporting about this um uh consolidation of groups that you think a 28 year old gangbanger from quebec city who had probably never left quebec city would be able to go on a year and a half run through Europe, I just wouldn't be possible if he didn't have someone like the Rizzutos exactly. providing Scott, him the resources to do that. Scott, even a guy, okay, I'll give you an example, uh, on the run, okay, a huge member like uh, Casper or you know, with all the resources that he has already, it would be incredibly expensive yes. to send a man anywhere, you know, moving from, Mont uh, from Montreal then to to the states and then whatever to to Italy to Spain to Portugal and then to Morocco or or Africa some places yeah. in Africa it takes it takes hideouts it takes places and it needs connections and if if people think that he's not connected with one yeah. side because and and it's kind of funny because he's trying to get what he's trying to get uh, the hell's angels 
out of, we we'll say, right. Quebec, and with the help of the old OGs, which yeah. is Rizzuto doesn't have any soldiers, we could right. say, on the street. I'm not saying that he doesn't, but, you know, you understand no, what I'm saying. That, that's the benefit of Blood Family Mafia when they yeah. came to, to uh, Vito, or not Vito, when they came to uh, Leo Rizzuto, allegedly, uh, almost two years ago, he, they weren't coming, like, do us a favor. They were like, we'll do you a favor, and then you do us a favor. It's like Absolutely. You know, uh, um, a symbiotic. Exactly. You cannot leave the country that easily. You know, it's not it's not that easy to leave a country, you know. So you need help. You need a lot of help. And the Rizzutos has have that backbone. So it's kind of simple how this is going around, you know. And, he's, and being they, hunt, he's being hunted by RCMP, Interpol. Exactly, and the Hell's Angels that yeah, allegedly sure. have a, a half million dollar contract on. Like, like you said, there's people sent in Europe, yeah. you know, to try to find them and all that. So it, and there, there's all these individuals who can say, "Listen, if I bring him in, if I kill him, I might have some clout." I so he's living really, really under you need to, you know underneath uh, total stress right now. No matter who he is, right. you know, and he doesn't even know that if. Rizzutos, are they going to sell them out? Yeah. Exactly. Right. I know. I, the every, you know, you don't got to. I, 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 I don't want to be redundant, but it's one of my favorite sayings, and I, I'm going to credit a mentor of mine, George Anastasia, and then I kind of added on to it. But you know, when it comes to traditional organized crime in America, you kind of have to worry about the double cross. <laughs> um, when you get into these other levels of like where it's it's beyond the pale. It's not your normal everyday mafia, you know, functionality. When you have what's going on in what's going on in Canada right now, it's like forget about the double cross or the triple cross. You got to worry about the quadruple cross. Absolutely. I mean, everybody's changing alliances every thirty seconds, and it, the guy it, that was your friend on Monday is trying to kill you on Tuesday. It's almost like a spy movie, you know. And yeah. they're, they're double agents or triple right. agents. They they become they're they're paranoid. They live in a world that we will never understand. So you don't know who you're talking to, who's going to double cross you, and everything. So it, it's kind of and it's important that people understand that this guy Turmel, if he's still alive, or, or it's because he's helped. It's not this guy from Mont from little Quebec City with uh, with unlimited resources. You know, maximum this guy would have. He's a kid. This guy's yeah, a kid. Exactly, exactly. He started this when he was twenty six. Exactly, and I mean, he might he might be a man very intelligent. I'm not I'm yeah. not uh, taking nothing away from him, but you have to understand that this guy takes millions and millions of dollars. You know, to 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 hide out. We know that El El Mayo got caught. Right. You know, and he was always on the run, and he had Mexico under. You had total control, we could say, of you know, of little cities and little towns. And this guy could live 20, 30, 40 years under the radar. Imagine this kid, twenty six years yeah. old. He needs help. It's impossible. And, and, and you know that the in terms of Interpol and RCMP, forget about the Hell's Angels. I know it's hard to forget about them because that's yeah. a, you know they've got guys going over there trying to kill them, but. Absolutely. We know that the RCMP and the, and the Interpol are on them like, like right this second because less than a couple of months ago, his right hand man or his bodyguard, uh, Ruben Denis, they call him the Rhino. Yeah, uh, he got picked up in Lisbon, Portugal. Exactly. So, and that was like in I think July or August. So yeah. you're, that wasn't that long ago that they were in Portugal actively searching. Uh, on tips, obviously, to exactly. get Jermel, and they and they stumble across Denis. So and and, the, and these days, yeah, you know, not to cut you off, but these days, with you know, uh, everybody thought the BlackBerry was a, a a phone that nobody could encrypt. You know, Renal Desjardins got caught because they decrypted everything. So now, every every communication is almost. You know, uh, you have to watch who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. you, you you have to watch who you're talking to, but you have to see that all this information is is on the web, is everywhere, you know, internet. So you have all these, C uh, not CIA, but FBI, uh, RCMP, uh, and uh, and Interpol that have all these tools to catch you. So he really needs to be really well protected yeah. to last this long. And I got a good, you know, I got a good tip that I'm I'm real confident on from um, 
uh, SQRCMP group that said that what what went down in September. I don't know. I don't think we know the guy's name, the young man's name, 14 year old that was murdered. Yeah, yeah. But at the meeting that took place to assign him that assignment to go torch the Red Devils clubhouse in Frampton uh, and shoot out and shoot at it and, and burn it, uh, according to my sources in law enforcement in Canada, Termel was not in the meeting where the fact that he was like zooming in or present there personally, but was texting during the meeting from wherever he is with serious encryption to like where, so the the 14 year old kid had some level of contact or people that were telling the 14 year old what to do were had contact with Tremel that same day. According, they're on they're on the same level as terrorists. You know, yeah. they have uh, all the same technology. They're uh, you know to talking to Tremel who's on a hideout, giving information to the killer who's yeah. 14 years old. You need to have a huge uh, and what system. Did- and what does it say? What does it say to you that this wasn't my reporting? So shout out to um, the Dirty News, who's a, a, a great uh, yeah, absolutely crime blog uh, out of uh, Canada. They were the first to report this. Um, within a couple days of the fourteen-year-old being found and that getting um, hit in the news and grabbing headlines, I don't even want to say days. I think within like twenty-four hours or forty-eight hours, Sky Langlois, who's the founding father of the Hells Angels in Montreal. Original Um, dancer. They call him Sky because he's a pilot. He's a pilot. He flies in uh, for a meeting. I think he flew into Eastern, uh, to the Eastern part of Quebec. Uh, He's South Shore, a South Shore Montreal guy. Uh, Flies in with an entourage and and, and conducts a meeting, like an emergency meeting. What is this? What does that say to you? (laughs) <laughs> it tells me it tells me that you know they're all connected in, in very they know exactly all these older guys are being told by the new, younger generation can you fix something for me or you know i mean uh, it's kind of hard for me to talk about skyline i don't know him but for, for for him the original gangster to to move to a a, a special conference means that this is you know the top level of the uh, the the Hell's Angels are in, are in it at a hundred percent. I mean, you know, they're uh, you and, talk go, about- and going to where the where it happened. This is ah, absolutely this, this that- happened in the eastern uh, the eastern part of Quebec. So yeah, he was exactly. coming into where this to the region or the area where the fourteen year old was was killed. Uh, my my opinion, uh, I'm telling you, that's what I see. I, the proxies are used by one or two, two of these groups. Because right now, that all they want is to take total control of the province. And they're giving these guys, these younger ones, they're giving them certain latitude. Some of them become, you know, a bit arrogant. And they say, okay, they gave, they gave me this for a couple of years. They gave me this for a couple of years. Now they think they can take control totally. But I think the Hells Angels and the mob right now, they're being attacked everywhere. You know, there's uh, there's uh, also Lebanese, you know. They're, the, yeah, there's this – I want to ask you about that. There's this Arab power crew um, that is a player in this war that we're just kind of learning about, unless at least the people that yeah. aren't, you know, the law enforcement, but, you know, the, yeah. the, the people that write about it and report on it. Um, so, yeah, you just mentioned them, so I just wanted to call it up for people. Well, it's historic, right? It, it, just think about – the immigration that came here to Canada, right? So in the States, New York, who was it? It was a lot of the Irish and a lot of Italians, right? At the first, and they formed their own little community because they, they, there was discrimination, all this, whatever it was. So they they did their little, right now, immigration doesn't come from Europe anymore. So we're coming from colonies that speak French because that's the laws here. So do we have a lot of Arabs coming from countries like with a, French, with, a, with a French influence, Fla- a French flavor, French Algeria, Morocco, and all that. So that's why Le- and, Lebanon, 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 exactly. But Lebanon is, but and that's what happens. So they're pushing all these people here. They're getting here, and some of them don't work, and some of them will push that 
exactly what the Italians and the Irish did at one point. Uh, uh, Montreal has a history. The Irish mob is incredibly important in this history, you know, the West End gang, because the Irish associated themselves with the French Canadians very fast. Why? Because both of them hated the English. <laughs> so Quebec, which wanted to separate, hated the powers to be, which was the English. And the Irish said, well, we'll join them. So there's a lot of French Canadians who got married with the Irish. And the West End gang, you know, was in Montreal for a couple of years or still. Even them, they're getting much older. Uh, but They're losing a bit of power, but they're, they're, they still have a little foot in the docks in, in, in uh, and playing off, playing off what you're saying, again, based on some of the stuff I've reported recently, uh, the Marauders yeah. Motorcycle Club, which is kind of the the main support club of the Hells Angels in Quebec right now, it, the, the Marauders are like their main enforcement group, um, kind of the equivalent of what the Rockers were uh, 25 years ago. 25 years ago. And the guy that's leading... The, the the Marauders, I'm told, is a guy named Diamond Dave Costelli, and Diamond Dave works worked works directly with the West End gang leadership. I mean, the Maddox uh, brothers and all those guys they love Diamond Dave. Absolutely. So it's like, like you're saying it's all this this is this giant like weave of a it's a, a ethnic <laughs> cultural yeah. gangland. It's uh, a vegetable soup, yeah, but, you know. Right. Before there was only one ingredient. Now there's six or seven in the soup, so they're all together. All they want is money and power. They don't care now that if you're Italian or just Italian, just right. Greek. They might have Castelli's Italian. Castelli's Italian. Exactly. Exactly. Right. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. Don't don't ever forget that the Montreal Salvatore Cazetta, right? Right. Is Italian also, you know, right. and, and he's he, a, one of the true OG powers in the hell. Abs right now. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, he's right. The, if he's not number two, him or and number Scott, three. him and Sky run the south, exactly, and then Marty runs the north and everything else. Um, Wait, can I, I can I add something just so yeah, you get? Sure. I, I just uh, on the legal aspect of it. Okay, I just at one point because of the public inquiry, I I had a lot of connections with legitimate contractors okay and these contractors were doing work everywhere in montreal and all this and through the decontamination they would push an agenda which is an incredible way to make money is like a lot of the cities even in the states you can say at the parallel is there a lot of these little towns were built because montreal needed to, to have suburbs, you know, because it costs too much money in Montreal or in New York and Chicago and Detroit. So they live outside. But all these little cities, all these little towns 20, 30 years ago were dumping grounds for, you know, the, the contamination they used to put. There. So some of these cities were built on scrapyards, you know, and then all of a sudden the, lay, the mayors of these cities couldn't afford so they accepted that you put scrap and then they put tires and then they put cars, they put everything in it. And then 20, 30 years ago, the land is becomes, uh, instead of agricultural, becomes residential. They bring up the price and they build houses over it. So now they have to decontaminate the land that the proper city contaminated themselves. And they're making, and the, and the, the gangsters are making money on every, Every, exactly. le every level of this ladder, exactly. every, every wrong on the ladder. Exactly. That's why I'm saying they're controlled from, from the dumping to analyzing the soil. It's their companies. And Louis-Pierre Lafortune, like I said, is one very smart man. I'm let's, telling get back, you let's, get, let's go back to him. And Okay, okay. So let me just set it up and I'll give it back to you. So Ken's talking about how these alleged criminally controlled legitimate businesses are getting legitimate contracts from other really legitimate businesses that don't have criminals behind them. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Valosphere and what LaPresse uh, and LaRouche reported, you're talking about Valosphere, which is the, the main uh, uh, truck company that's hauling all this environmental 
they're getting all these environmental contracts to haul contaminated soil from construction sites to dump sites. 75% of Ballosphere's bottom line comes from the province of Quebec. Absolutely. Quebec, the province is hiring that well, up until last month was hiring Ballosphere. Now, the article that LaRouche and LaPress put out was talking about how Quebec has told Ballosphere as of the end of the summer, we are now cutting off all contracts with you because of our investigation finding that you're being run by organized crime. Now, that brings us to LaFortune, who, while he's not the CEO of Ballosphere, he is a in a consultancy position that, according to SQ and RCMP, he's running the show. So Absolutely. to give people an analogy, you know, pop culture analogy, in the movie Casino, uh, Lefty, or in the movie he's called him Ace. Yeah. Ace doesn't run the casino in uh, in theory. He's the head of uh, the entertainment or food and beverage or whatever. But in reality, he's calling the shots. So there's a guy named Goulet who's actually the head of the company who they who they claim doesn't do anything. And Le Fortune, Le Fortune is the one that's actually shot calling. La Fortune has all of these ties, guys, you know, directly to uh, Casper the Ghost and uh, all those people. And then, according to my reporting, as well as some of the stuff put in um, uh, Vincent LaRouche's story, last year, in the same couple of days that Chit Del Basso is assassinated, um, you had Fess Ploof, who is Marty Robert's right-hand man, sitting next to La Fortune at a restaurant and meeting with a La Fortune employee or an employee of Valos there named uh, Stefan Menard, who is a convicted Hells Angels member who has allegedly left his colors behind. But it looks like based on the reporting of LaRouche, based on what the RCMP and SQ is saying about Valosphere, it looks like this is a company and an industry that's being completely controlled by the Hells Angels right now. Listen, it's copy and paste of what, what, the, what they did with the Solidarity Fund with the FTEQ. At one point, uh, Louis-Pierre Lafortune is working for a crane company, okay, which is G. G-U-A-Y, the biggest screen company in Canada at that time. Huge contract. They got, they, they got, they, they started with the Olympics. We could say really a power and they, they control everything. All right. Val and Val the Valosphere is a $75 million a year company. Uh, absolutely. Right. Right. So, uh, along the lines of what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. But even Gay was even bigger than that in, right. in a sphere. But what, what's kind of fun. So people understand. Who are the two first people on any major job site? One of them is the soil. Are we going to put more soil? Is the soil uh, padded enough so we can build stuff on it or whatever? And the second one is a crane companies because the crane companies are put in a specific place and they last the three to six to seven months the contract is done, so they put it so you know the trucks can come in, they can build those walls and all that. And Louis Pierre Lafortune worked for a company, a crane company. He was a consultant that later on we find out that it was associated with the Hells Angels. Even their colors were red and white. <laughs> you know, so to make almost the matters better, they, we found out that later every uh, police station was built, <laughs> the foundation was built by this guy who had ties to the mob so you understand why nobody wants to get this out out mm -hmm. because the legitimate companies are built are using contractors who are using subcontractors who are totally infiltrated by the mob right so it, that that's how it is and then the solidarity fund or investment quebec investment quebec say they lend money to you you hire me i'm hiring a guy that is totally 100% non-legitimate. So this is where the political aspect gets scared a bit because they say, we're, 
we we were supposed to know about this. We were supposed, and then we had these things like Louis Pierre Lafortune, who, in a certain sense, I I met him a couple of times. I know him very well. Uh, <laughs> I can call him a weasel, but I can also tell you he's a very smart man. You know, he knows with who to line up to make money, and he makes money for these people. And he, and, you know, and he's all his life he's been there, and he he's a style of guy. If you know him. You know, he likes to be, a, he's a businessman, could make millions with his brains, but he loves to be around these people. It's almost like it gives him credibility, the credibility no, that he doesn't have. There's currency and proximity. Exactly. I've, I've exactly. learned that in my, in my 20 I, years of doing this. Well, that's good. That's very good because I didn't use that word, but it's exactly that. So you know exactly right. that's what he likes. He likes that 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 that, that power that he doesn't have, that he can't get because he's not a killer, he's not a, you know, he's not a, a gunman or whatever. Yeah. But but through his intelligence and his know-how, this is the same guy, like I told you, and a thousand de la commune had liberal MPs giving him a fundraiser while all of these guys are connected, you know, with with the yeah, for people that don't understand when he said when he's talking about he's talking about a, a political party in yeah. In Canada, when you're saying liberal, Quebec. Right. yeah, exactly. Right. You're not just talking about like in America when, when someone says they think just somebody that's like a left leaning Democrat. No, he's talking about an actual political party was hosting events for this guy. Absolutely, yeah. and don't I'll tell you how far this goes because of diligence, the operation diligence. We find out, we find out at one point there's a very important. Uh, uh, not a mafia, but a, a union leader called Eddie Brandoni. And he's following, he's getting, he's being followed by cops. And he's going to a fundraiser of Jean Charest, which is our prime minister at that time. And the cops, we hear this live, the cops are telling, are calling it their superiors and say, listen, he's going to this hotel that that day he's going to meet. Says, And we hear the superior say, cut, cut, stop following him. So you see how close the proximity between, you know, the political side and these people. So Montreal and Quebec has enormous skeletons in their closets, you know. And the RICO law, with all its negative, has killed maybe the mobsters in 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 it's the had state. Had a major major impact. Major impact. Mexico doesn't have anything, and you see why they're so. You know, everybody says, "Oh, they only have one gun shop." Yeah, but they, you know, they they control everybody who has guns is the cops or uh, the cartels. Here in Quebec, because they're not major, uh, major uh, the punishments are very punishment. exactly uh, tame <laughs> when you when you when you compare it to organized crime prosecutions in America and you 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 put that up against gangsterism charges yeah. in Canada which is their version of racketeering um just to give an example of someone we're talking about today uh Casper the Ghost he was convicted or or acknowledged to have murdered 13 people he did 12 years 13 years like someone like that in in the United States would never see the light of day, but yeah. he goes in in 09 and walks out in 03. Or sorry, goes in in 09 walks out in 23. So he had 14 years, or maybe went 10. He did about 12, 13 years for 12, 13 murders. Uh, but but uh, to not to his defense, I'm not trying to defend him. But the the cops also you know, at one point we can speak about some some tactics they used that was completely non legitimate and that's why well, yeah, a lot a lot of hell's angels were 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 yeah. taken away and uh, well, brought back a, to society yeah there one of the busts in the late 2000s um was kind of rife with corruption and yeah. it resulted in a number of uh, uh big time targets and what looked like gets um or collars to either not have to do prison time or or little prison time yeah, um, absolutely Let's contextualize this within the the um, the example that we're given of values value value sphere, which is yeah. kind of a microcosm of I think what's going on uh, overall, and and talking about this kind of shift in power. But before I say this, I want to also say, and you mentioned this, don't count the Rizzutos out. I mean, I said this in one of my more recent videos. If this is a boxing match, yeah, the Rizzutos look like they were 
going to be down for the 10 count really early in this thing. But now we're like in the 10th round and the Rizzutos are, are, are swinging off the ropes. They're rocky. Uh, They're rocky. They're coming yeah. back. <laughs> so, I mean, I would still, I would still give the, uh, the edge in this thing to the Hells Angels. And if I had to predict where this is going to be in a couple of years, I, I would say that I, I could see that the, Rizzuto's almost become a wing of the Hells Angels, but that's yet to be seen. But right now, the Rizzuto's are fighting back. Leo Rizzuto is far from dead. I predicted uh, back in early 24 that he wouldn't survive the year. The joke's on me. He seems to have been uh, way more resilient and, and savvy in this than I gave him credit for. So I what I'm about to say in terms of giving the uh, – kind of reading the tea leaves in Ballosphere and asking – um, Ken's uh, insight into it. I'm not trying to say that the Rizzutos are no longer players or factors. So with that said, within Valosphere, within the um, investigation that LaPress did, and again, reading the tea leaves here, it, it appears that in addition to La Fortune, you have a guy named uh, Roberto uh, Amato, you have a guy named Tony Papa, who are involved in Valosphere. And these were guys that 10, 15 years ago were, you know, ardent Rizzuto guys. Absolutely. Guys that were reporting directly to the Rizzutos. Um, now in 2024, it appears that they've kind of understood where their bread is buttered now and they are no longer um, loyal to the Rizzutos. They're loyal to the, the Hells Angels and who's calling shots within Ballosphere. And I kind of see that as a, again, Ballosphere being a microcosm and then that kind of situation within the situation being a microcosm of, of the, the shift. You're, you you're, you're absolutely right. And don't forget, and that Tony Papa, there's a link also with Tony Papa and Salvatore Cazetta because they were caught at one point pumping dumps. Okay. With, with, with the, uh, at the stock market, okay, with with mining companies and all that. So that's another story at one point if you want to. Tony Papa, and it shows really where he was. He was sitting down with the Rizzutos. He was their, you know, their man. And they, no, I know. They got him all – they got the – um in the in the mid-2000s, the bus – I think the bus that – one of the bus that took down a big chunk of Rizzuto leadership. I don't know if it was the veto bus. But one Cal of the bus that took Calize, wasn't it Calize? They wasn't had a they had a wiretap where the uh, uh, Skunk Giordano and uh, the original Soft Solicito uh, and some other people were caught on the wire complaining about Tony Papa and yeah, how, exactly. how, how how they've had to how they have, have to maintenance him and he's not doing what he's told and. And, and uh, to, to show a bit what you're saying about the Rizzuto, Solicito, you know, because of the cancer and all that, I think people took it for granted that maybe, you know, they had maybe already a knee on the floor and they were going to leave quietly and they're going to give it away. But uh, they're still very, very influential and money, money buys a lot of a lot of things and lo buys loyalty at one point. Well, and little saw Solicito right now. Like you said, the rumors are that he's been battling um, health issues and cancer. Yeah. Um, but he's not just battling, you know, the the, the health gods. He's, know. according to um, SQ in, a, in, in some court filings in the last month or two, he's a top suspect in the 2020 murder of uh, a guy they call BM Montpont, I think is. I Montpont, mean, what? Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it, uh, he's a black man with uh, yeah. a, a type of you know, funny head. I don't know if you noticed it. You know, yeah. his and head he, was deformed a bit or he, something. He had the he allegedly had a contract on Solicito yeah. from the Scopa brother. I know this is so confusing for people that are maybe just cons absolutely, just absolutely. tuning in here. Hey, so I apologize. And the Scopa brothers is an incredible story, also with yeah. one of their lieutenants, which was P a Ponytail. I don't know if you right know. Ponytail Devito. <laughs> that him, he died of cyanide in prison. In prison, right. And where we think there was the Rizzutos that gave it to him. And he, this guy, his kids were killed by his wife, you know, and then he was able to come out of prison to hide in the funeral home to see his kids for two days or whatever it was. Yep. And then to die back in prison yep. by cyanide. It's almost like a, a story that you couldn't you could, make. You couldn't make this you up. You couldn't make if, this up. Exactly. If you put... If you put the best Hollywood screenwriters 
in a room 10 years ago and you said, this is what's going to happen. I mean, what was going on 10 years ago was crazy. Yeah, absolutely. What's, what, what's been going on since then is even 10 times crazier. And I just don't think uh, – this is this is this will be studied these last 20 years and who nice. knows how it's gonna end but hopefully it ends soon but, but, uh, you know, but was I, study I want... the, these decades of, of uh, turmoil and it's just uh, it's mind mind bending don't don't forget that it's very important to all of these. Uh, Vito Rizzuto's one thing is he didn't want to be close no matter how much money there was he didn't want to be close to illegal uh crime right so he he tried to become what we say a legitimate uh, mm -hmm. businessman and we see exactly the same thing that's happening with some high up Hells Angels and that's where the decontamination, the environmental the valosphere the, we're putting legitimate people on top that get because the contracts that you get from the government are astonishingly big, huge and don't forget again another thing that's quite important, some of these people will sell you the land for a dollar with a dollar right and it's with the illusion saying you will decontaminate that land which is worth 70 million 80 million dollars so if you control from the start to the end this type of business you're buying land for a dollar you're putting maybe a million dollars in the contamination that is worth 60, 70, 80 million. So you, you see how much money you're, you can be made. And then you're selling it to the country, to the city, to an environment for 400, 500 million dollars. So it's that's why the Valosphere is such an important company right now to understand. And don't forget, Renal Desjardins, when he was legitimate, he said, I'm going into Carbonert. Carbonert was a company that was also in the environmental process. They had an environmental that they could clean the, the environment, the, the soil, better than anybody. They had this special thing. So you have to understand that everybody is going towards this. And the, what we're doing here is doing in the States. The, believe me, it's doing in the Europe and it's doing everywhere. But we don't want to touch it because there's enormous players. And when I say players, I say the government. You know, the government has enormous clout. And if you're associated with the mob, then a Vincent Larouche can come out the story and can say, listen, and that's why, don't forget, with the public inquiry, there's two units. One was Unité Permanente Anticollision. It's a cop. It's a police, uh, a police uh, organization that to combat crime and uh, and corruption and they have enormous power they can take away all your licenses they can take away the right for you to have uh, uh, con uh, government contracts so imagine if valusfair loses all these government contracts you know where you know this is going to hit them really in the wallet all right i got two things um, yeah. i want to hit on from some stuff that you just said first off I think uh, speak to this. So um, we said we talked about Tony Papa, who's who's involved in Valley Spirit. I mentioned Robert Amato or Roberto Amato, and his connection, uh, in addition to the the Hell's Angels people, was well, his connection at one point with the Rizzutos was through Tony Suzuki. Yeah. Now Tony Suzuki, whose real name is Antonio Petrip Tantonio, um, Petrip yeah. Sorry. Um, he was one of the main Vito Rizzuto construction lieutenants. Um, he was one of the people that sided against Vito Rizzuto uh, in the first part of this war and, and aligned with Desjardins. Um, so I think, so this is kind of a two-part question. So first, where do you think Tony Suzuki is in some of this? And then second off, in terms of Desjardins, we just kind of heard our first kind of like update on him since he got paroled. Uh, and I don't remember if it was the Journal uh, de Montreal or if it was La Presse, but one of those groups, one of those um, media outlets came out with a story that recently nice. that Desjardins is kind of back in the mix and has 
a guy that <laughs> was one of his lieutenants named Jack Simpson, who's 82 exactly. years, 82 years old. And he's trying and, to get his colors. <laughs> and he's right now prospecting for the Hells Angels at 82. Exactly. Uh, and he's not even a prospect yet. He's a hang around. And then to become a prospect, you got to start as a hang around. So, and he's where, and according to this reporting, and he, there's no reason to believe it's not true. He's been, he's been seen around town. Uh, the last month or two, wearing a vest with, you know, they give you the vest that's like not <laughs> yeah, yeah, fully exactly. formed yet. You don't have your yeah. patch, but you got the vest. And he's walking around town and, and representing Desjardins. So Absolutely. kind of talk about Suzuki and talk about Desjardins and where they where they are right now. Well, listen, right, in, your opinion, in your opinion. In, in your my opinion. opinion. Uh, Renal Desjardins, in my opinion, I met him. Like I, I said already, I met him. I met him because at one point, uh, they... I had a conversation because I was mixing a bit. I was talking to the wrong people and I was causing a bit of trouble. I could say in their, in their, in their team, you know, the, so I had this huge meeting with Renal Desjardins at a Hilton in Laval. And he told me quite simply he says, hey, listen, Ken, uh, it's enough that Tony Accurso, which was the biggest contractor in Quebec and Jean Lavallée, which was the head of the FTQ. They have to start splitting the pie. They have to start splitting, splitting, uh, splitting the pie with me talking about Renal Desjardins and with my associate Justin Dupuis. So, and I told them, listen, I have no, I have no players in this. I have no horses in this game. All I want is my union to be completely free of all of you guys. I have nothing. I don't care if you go somewhere else. If you take control of this union. Uh, what I found out about him, and I have to give him credit, is what he told me was always, you know, up and up. You know, he never, never even tried to influence me or or tell me anything. But he just told me simply and clear, Ken, this belongs to us. It's our turn. It's mine and all my players. And if you want to have a part of it, you just tell me. Just sign here what you want. And this was exactly yeah, sign in blood, <laughs> sign, whatever you know. He told me that Jocelyn Dupuy was the leader of the FTQ at that time. He said, "I'm going to send them to Europe. I'm going to send them. He's going to go around with his cars and his boats, and he's he's going to sail for me. you. You can do whatever you want. You got a brain on you. Believe me, you you're in Alberta. You sign all this. Just tell me what you want." So Renal Desjardins is a man that some people I talked to told me that they they told them. Listen, give us your run, give us a bit of money, and we'll let you live. That was the rumors a couple of years ago, okay? And today, it's completely different. It's like he's, I think it's after the hit of Mambushi on him or something. He, he, he gained that clout or he said, oh, no, they're trying to kill me. It's over for them. And he associated them themselves with the enemies of Rizzuto because it's his enemy. And I think he's going to be a major player maybe in a year or two. Because he's he's either just getting off parole or is off parole. I know he was let out of prison in, in early 23. He had then he got out. caught. He got right. caught eating with a guy that had a, right. that had a what's it called, a, a criminal record, and they brought him in. But that's that that's sometimes the tactics of the cops, right? right. They, they sent you a guy sitting there and then just because they want to bring him in. So, so I think I, he, was, he was out for a second in like 21 or 22. Had to go exactly. Back, back in. Now he's been back out for over a year. Uh, but this, more specifically, what is it? What does the Simpson thing say to you? That an eight that that you have an. To me, my reporting is telling me that this is just for a way for Desjardins to, to have. Away. Yeah, it's his fault. Like, it's well, his and, fault, right? And have this guy at meetings. That he wouldn't be able to be at exactly without a patch, and then he's listen. He's a mouthpiece for Dejer Den. Absolutely. Rivera. Listen, at eighty-two, you're not a prospect. You know, he's not going to yeah. go and <laughs> wash the bikes right. and all that. So you'll never. So uh, that's he's exactly his mouthpiece. He he's exactly his front man and his man. I, that's what I think. His man. That means that's why I'm telling you. I think that he's back into the game. You know, because uh, Renal Desjardins is like seven years old also. Right, so he's not, not old. Like, I mean, he's uh, old, but he's not old. Yeah, but he, he has maybe a good 10, 15 years that he can still, you know, p 
push his thing and he has family and he and his right hand man i think it was married to his daughter is like it is Victoria Marachi, exactly yeah. so you know it's so you you uh, i think he wants that part still and he has a vendetta against the risottos that is to me you know they killed one of his yeah, lieutenants Johnny, Johnny, that's a we talked about this on the last episode yeah. but i'll just say it again i, I think that it's such a under or over, I'd say overlooked aspect of all of this. Um, people talk about the war. They talk about Vito Rizzuto uh, leaving town and, and losing control of the empire and all yeah. the bloodshed and all. But people seem to forget, you know, uh, gloss over the fact that he alienated him. And I'm not, ex I'm not excusing any of this. No, no, it's all horrible. Wrong. But just explaining it, he alienated himself from Desjardins, who he needed because he, he was not on the ground anymore. He was in yeah. prison. Yeah, exactly. He needed Desjardins more than ever, and instead he alienates him by killing one of Desjardins' best friends without exactly. uh, getting an okay from Desjardins. Johnny, and to Ber show, Johnny Bertolo. And to Johnny Bertolo. And to show you how much he liked him, I went to meet Tony uh, Renal Desjardins, and who was at his office with him? The brother of Bertolo. Right. That was working for uh, Renal Desjardins. So uh, we see that Renal had some family, you know, in a weird way, some family aspects that says, I believe in this, I believe in these people, and I, I, I'll go to I'll go to bat for them. But you know, I think uh, Vito made a mistake, totally misunderstood the, the vengeance that was gonna come through killing his best friend or and his he, good friend. And then just like you know, nobody can predict the future, I'm sure. Vito didn't realize that the way that the the gangland gods were gonna shine yeah. on on Canada, they, they were gonna bring a New York mafia don uh, deported to to Montreal, Sal Montagna, yeah. who was more than willing to join forces with Desjardins at first to try to take the throne. Uh, he, he didn't when Vito Rizzuto in two thousand four, five, six, seven. He didn't know any of that was about to happen in absolutely not. And I'll tell you a story about Montagna. The Montagna, the first week he came here, the rumors circulated that he went to see multi-billion dollar companies established there in Montreal yeah. and says, you're going to give me money. And you. So he started to rock the boat pretty well and saying, and that's where Desjardins and him and even Simpson started saying, whoa, who the hell are you? Who do you think you're going to come and control here? I, I was told, or I saw in some uh, law enforcement intelligence, uh, SQ and FBI, I think, that Simpson was the one who actually made the intro. Because Simpson had people yeah. from New York that he had done business in the drug world with uh, in the Bananos. He, Simpson met Desjardins in prison. I think they were in a U.S. prison together. Uh, and then Desjardins helped, or sorry, Simpson helped broker the introduction and alliance. With, I believe with it. I believe it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. It makes sense. But, you know, listen, when one guy thought he was... Because don't ever forget the, the Italian mob, you have to be Italian, right? So Desjardins always took second fiddle, always took, and it was a loyal man to Vito. And maybe Montagna said, I'm, you're not Italian, so you're not going to take over. I'm going to take over. And, you know, that's where I think the war started a bit. It if, seems like and it, I'm, this is an aside, and then and then I want to touch on one thing before we wrap up. Uh, it seems like Sal Montagna, and I, I guess I want to uh, put this to a, uh, put this all together, and then pose a question to you, and then we'll go on to the, the last thing I want to talk about. But it seems like there's a little hubris in some of these leaders. Both uh, it, Leo Rizzuto, when he avoided assassination in March of twenty three. He had been keeping a routine, going to the same cafe in Laval every afternoon. So he was easy to, 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 to clock. And then he wasn't, there was no security with him. He had no bodyguard. He had no driver. It just, it seems so counterintuitive. And this, knowing what he knew to be traveling minus any security. Then you move, or not move, but then you go backwards um, to 2000. And uh, 11, I believe, when Montana's killed, Montana's killed. And he just shows up by himself. And I guess he, 
I think there had been issues between him and Deja. He was going to saw he was going to try to like resolve some issues between them. Simpson goes and picks him up at the train station. <laughs> exactly. And takes and and just Simpson Sal Montana doesn't bring anybody. He doesn't bring a bodyguard. He doesn't bring any lieutenants. And Jack Simpson drives him to, to Simpson's house, which is like in the woods, away from everybody, and they kill him. Rizzuto was lucky to survive it. But I'm just looking, I'm like, whoa. I'm just again. I'm comparing it to American mafia wars that I've studied, and just thinking about what was going on in Philadelphia in the '90s, or with the Colombo crime family in the '90s. When these bosses left their house, in the when these wars were going on, they'd have ten guys with them. Absolutely. Listen so, here in Montreal. How many of these mobsters were killed outside of a gym alone, right? With right. nobody. Yes. So exactly. It's always. They, I, I don't know if it's arrogancy, you know, that they think they're not they're untouchable. Also. There was rumors circulating uh, some of them that they were really cheap. They, they don't want to pay the security, uh, yeah. security. So, it, it, you know, uh, don't forget that Vito Rizzuto fought her. You know, no bulletproof windows, nothing. I mean, you know, they're untouchable as, uh, at one point. You know, nobody's going to touch me. Nobody's going to hit me. The Teflon Don, we had him. So uh, sometimes it's just you're always in the same place at the same time. So you're always talking to the same people and you think that nobody's nobody's out for you and you're just living in another world you know because there's guys who are following you every day they know exactly what you're doing you know they know that little routine like you just said which is to to totally absurd if you're living in that world and on the other side on the other side of it and i'm no i've never murdered anyone i've never been part of a murder conspiracy it's all you know in yeah. theory in theory with me the suburban jewish kid who grew up uh, you know at not, so yeah, yeah. far so far away from this world um <laughs> the the dobasso marty robert hit crew that tried to carry this out this is rhetorical by the way yeah. Why don't you just hit him in the parking lot of the of the cafe as he's going to his car? Why wait for him to get into the car and get on the expressway and make things know. more difficult for you? So just just do it, Paul Castellano style. Lying, absolutely, hit him, absolutely. Lying, hit him, get him face down in the in the parking lot. I don't know. Sometimes they, they think that maybe there's a camera there or whatever. I don't it, know it, what it, it cost, is. Well, it cost Chitel Basco's life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. Did. Yeah, by absolutely. Fucking, by fucking up that hit, Del Basso yes. put a. That's uh, why you had to leave. You had to leave. Right. He even said it. You know, I have to leave now. It's over. But I, I just, if, I'm just thinking to myself, if I, and I know that Del Basso was in, well, I don't know, the, it came out in court filings yeah. this year, that was in contact with this hit team, you know, uh, minute by minute while they were planning this. And I just don't know why he didn't just say, just get him coming out of the cafe. Uh, uh, you're right. About I, that. I digress. <laughs> digress uh, so, but... last thing I want to talk about and kind of bring us back to where we started. Um, at the end of the day, the mob is really just about economy. You know, it's all, you're all fighting for, for the bottom line. Yeah. So the piece of the pie, like I said, you know, yeah. they're, they so, want to eat it, all of it. So, it, you know, my, um, what, what I'm kind of espousing here is that Marty Robert is in some ways, uh, morphing into a 2020s version of Vito Rizzuto, who just happens to be the leader of a, a motorcycle club as opposed to the leader of uh, Italian organized crime group. And within that, you know, he's playing chess when a lot of other people are playing checkers. And he's he sees a long game. And um, I, I, I've been told uh, and I've reported that he... Not not just great for his pocketbooks in terms of getting the Hell's Angels getting control of the environmental hauling uh, um, racket or business yeah. c uh, trucks, and I, and then I'm reporting you know the construction trade as a as a as a uh, as a general rule. You, you're t this is tactical. He, he's bleeding resources from the Rizzutos by cutting them out of a lot of these deals that they controlled. Can you kind of talk to, uh, I mean, we talk about this with the, the environmental hauling, but just in general, the, the construction, trucking, environmental, how how much money there is, and if you can control it, how that, that then can propel you into controlling sectors of the underworld that you wouldn't have had before. Well, uh, 
listen, I'll start with the beginning, what I told you also. You're on the land site, which a billion dollar shopping center will be built, okay? So who's the first two people there? Like I said, it's the people who analyze the soil, see if it's hard enough to, to hold uh, tons and tons of this. Uh, is, are we going to have to decontaminate or not? And the second companies that could get there is the crane companies. The crane, we install five, six of them at specific areas because they're going to stay there. At the, so what's happening with a lot of these people is they're controlling that aspect. And after they know exactly from there, okay, they're going to build shopping center here. Okay, after the shopping center, we need contractors <coughs> from the cement. Oh, Casper. What was Casper wanted to do 20, uh, 10 years ago? So, that, so that's another thing is that you know, Casper was the guy that was running all the construction rackets <laughs> it, for the it, Hells Angels before Marty took over in the 2000s. Exactly. And he was the mastermind behind it. He took over a lot of these companies cement, uh, everything that was structural, right? So around the structure of a... So what's he doing? If if we're listening to Marty or we think we're analyzing his, his ideas, is he's starting from the root. He's starting from the ground and he's building up everything. So he's starting from the construction site, from the bottom to control everything. Then he'll decide he can control who's the carpenters going, the electrical companies going in. He, he can, he has, and Louis Pierre Lafortune, if he's there, he has the analyze. He says, listen to this, okay? There's going to be a million dollars in painting, uh, five million dollars in structure, 14 million dollars in cement wall, you know? And he can, the second he gets into a site, he has all his men in place. That can tell him this is exactly. Then he pushes through the general contractor the companies that he wants there, and that's where where you, you it's an infinity amount of money that you and it's legitimate and yep. it's legit. And don't forget another tactic that they use because government will always say, "Okay, Scott, you want to de decontaminate? How many trucks do you have? Oh, I only have five. Okay, it's going to take us." Uh, 14 years to, to take out all the land here. Let's go get another guy. Let's go get Ken Pereira. He has 400 trucks. Right. And 400 trucks are all under the control of illegitimate men. So that's that's how they're they're trying to develop and their, their structure and they're opening it up more and more. And then we had the fabulous 13 here in Quebec, which was they used to have 13 companies that used to go play golf and fix the prices, fix the prices and say, today, Scott, you're going to have it next next contract. I have it now. They're trying to say, let's use the same tactics. But the 13 contracts that are there. We all control them. So it's not even a we're not even price gouging each other. We're just bringing up the, the price. <laughs> So the so the the government will say, "Oh, I'm going on the lower one," but the lowest one is controlled by the biggest one. Do you, I don't know if I'm. Uh, I'm making no, I get it. No, I understand yeah. it. So and that that that's how it is. And I think, like I said, exactly what you said about Vito. I think Marty Robert wants to be the head of the table. The, you know, and he's 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 putting all his pieces on the chessboard and saying. You're going to have this, you're going to have this, you're going to have this, but we're going to uh, control all of this. And the construction industry is one of it. And, and look how he presents himself. Oh, he yeah, doesn't yeah. present himself like Mom Boucher did oh, no, or no, no, no. Nurget did. He, he can, he, he's, a, he's a chameleon. I mean, oh, and, and he can sit with these Italian mafia bosses in, in the United States where I've heard that there's been several meetings. And I'm going to go further than that. Sorry, Scott. I think no. he can sit down with politicians yeah right he can sit down with that's a normal a, businessman yeah. which will not be which will not be intimidated because he has that jacket you understand he's gonna think they're gonna talk to him legitimately and then you know that's what's happening and uh, he has a, a chameleon is a great thing he, he has the power to to bring all these people together but he has to get rid of some of them to show his strength and he still really hasn't I mean, for people that study this stuff and follow it, he's a household name, but 
He's really not a household name anywhere Absolutely right not. now, even in Canada, the way that Mom Boucher was or, um, you know, other past high profile biker bosses. It's uh, yeah, that's that's the that's the chameleon. I mean, he, he doesn't want that. He wants the exact same attitude that Vito got in a certain way. You know, he doesn't he wants to pass under the radar, totally under the radar. He's uh, he's on the radar just because there's a war right now. Well, and I, I'm doing a lot of reporting on him. Uh, of I'm course, the, the one that's reporting on him the most. I've, um, I, I don't. Know, I get. I've been told by people that I, that, that it's ballsy. Uh, you know, it is. It when, is when absolutely. I, when, when, when I was uh, working on our our vice project um, about the Hell's Angels, there was a lot of writers, reporters, and law enforcement that were very gun shy for lack of a better word or hesitant to talk publicly about marty robert um which i guess that kind of intimidation factor at least in canada seems to be paying off and unless you're i mean i'm knit i'm niche i mean people you have to really like gangsters and, yeah. and the inside baseball of gangsters to be following me but um uh, I'm, I'm well, happy I, I, if you want if i'm the only guy that's going to give you marty robert news great i'll be i'll be that guy well, listen, you're giving uh, inside information that uh, not a lot of people know. And if we ever do another one, we if will. you, we were, but we're gonna, I, we're I'd love to talk the end of the year. Okay. I'd love to talk about, you know what? The corrupt cops in Montreal, because we have a history of three or four that are mainstream that sat down. Benoit Aberge, Jan Davidson, and sat down with the Hells Angels, sat down with the mobsters and this was all documented so it's not me that has inside information but it's it's just to show you that they're strange bedfellows together you know and it, we have a history we have a huge history of politicians with mobsters with uh, with, with uh, biker gangs and all this and uh, hollywood you did a show in hollywood you know about hollywood yeah, montreal <laughs> You know, we, I don't know if you follow hockey. Did you ever follow hockey? Yeah. Chris Nile. Okay. I'm the Red Wings. I'm the Red Wings, man. That's, of that's, course. They, they dominated Chris, this town's news headlines for 20 Chris years. Chris Nyland was an old player of the Canadians. Okay. He was Knuckles. He was a fighter and all this. Yeah? Well, he was married to Whitey Bulger's daughter. Right. And Whitey, and there's a picture of Whitey with the Stanley Cup and him. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So it's all these stories. You know, we have Icon, a girl, a woman here, Jeanette Renault. Is an icon. She went to a mom Boucher's wedding. She went to sing. You know, so we have all these links that are everybody knows a bit of everything, but no, everybody keeps it quiet. You know, we had these icons like Jean Ferlin <laughs> that he went again sing in for a Hell's Angels party, and, and it's it's there's so many under stories in Quebec around the mob. The bikers, uh, the politicians. It's a cornucopia of gangster stories that never, and, that is just it's evergreen and it's and it's like stuff that you don't see anywhere else. Like no, we crazy don't see stuff that you it's, can't it's, make it's, up. It's the same thing that's happening. What happened maybe in Detroit, in New York, in the 1970s, where we have restaurants here that second floor there was politicians third yeah. floor there right. was mobsters right. it was like you know you stay there i stay there and we'll meet in the toilets you know or something it was it's an incredible city well there was a way. in detroit there was a famous raid this was back in the 60s uh the main kind of uh, hangout for the mob guys in downtown detroit was called grecian gardens and in the back of grecian gardens was the place where uh, the, the judges and the yeah. police officers and the mobsters would all go make their deals and when the when they raided the place, they found people they shouldn't have found in the back room, and they found all these black books with ledgers and yeah. You know. I, I sent you an article, but uh, yeah, just to make it fast, here not far from my house in Saint Leonard, which is a Italian area, yeah, same they way. built they built a twelve condo uh, uh, apartment building. And half of it was sold to union leaders, and half of it was sold to mobsters. Right. You know, and they got it for about you know three quarters of the price, and it was all funded by you know a fund. So there's so many undercoats and so many stories around it, and it's you sit down with them, and all of the, all of them was always you know to me, especially to me, says Ken, how can I get to the solidarity fund? 
that, that was always you know, like if I had access to it, I'll get rid of everybody. And it was an open conversation like I'm talking to you. And so you see it was openly done in front of everybody. And it's it still is today with an undercoat of, uh, you know, hiding it. But really, it's open because there is no legitimate power to suppress what's happening on our streets. This was this was awesome, Ken. You've done it all. You've said it all. I'm hoping that you, you'll, you'll be true to, to your word and that you'll come back and be our kind of resident. I'll try. I'll Montreal try. Uh, Underworld. <laughs> insider analyst this was awesome especially especially the union side you know i yes. i got well, yeah. by, by luck by luck or unluck i met a lot of these guys it was kind of funny you don't meet them at all and all of a sudden when money is they 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 ask to come and see you and meet you, you know, so it's a it, it's kind of funny one well, last thing if you don't yeah, mind sure. just an undercoat but it's a funny aspect at one point i was invited by renal de jardin at a at a breakfast brunch right he tells me, you got to come, and that's it. And it's the head of the FTQ that makes me go there. So I said, I, I don't know him, never met him before and all this. And it's a brunch. It's 1130 in the morning, right? And there's about 12 <laughs> all men, pretty big men, sitting there pretty pissed off because they must have been woken up. You got to go there. and You got to meet them. So they're all sitting there with people of around 60 to 70 years old who are brunching. And them, they're all sitting there, not eating anything, just sitting there. And I have to pass through this wave of men. And I sit down and says, hey, I thought you wanted to meet me alone. He says, oh, these guys, uh, they just showed up. I don't know them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 you know, they're decor they're decor they're, it's for decorations. decorations. It was decoration, which is kind of, a, it's a good little understory. This is, uh, again, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, this is another great episode. I'd love to have Ken back on probably around the Christmas holiday to kind of maybe update us. I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that happens between uh, now and two months from now because uh, things are happening every, it seems like every second in, in Canada. Absolutely. There's Absolutely. more news to break re regarding the war. Ken, tell everyone where they can uh, find you uh, if they want to consume anything more. Not really. <laughs> okay, well, please come back, come, come back here in a couple months and, and we'll get Ken back on. We got exactly. another interview from back in the summer that you can go find where we yeah. talk more about Ken's backstory. Uh, Ken, thank you so much. This was this was thank truly you, Scott. great. Appreciate so, it. Thank uh, you. So the Ken is now another part of uh, this uh, late 2024 rush of long-term interviews that we're going to be rolling out. Uh, we took a break for about a month and didn't have many, and we're gonna we're gonna do uh, kind of double and triple time between now and the end of the year. Great interviews, exclusive interviews like this with Ken, where you're getting the only kind of uh, this type of insight, this type of analysis you're only gonna get here at OG Pod. Ken is is great. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you to the audience. We'll see you with another long form interview very soon. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod. I'm out.